Well, good evening. Welcome to the seventh summer of this Healthy Living Lecture Series brought to you by UAF Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. I'm Mike Powers. I'll be introducing tonight's speaker, but I just want to remind you that it's Michelle Bartlett that has brought this program to the community. And I just want to say that as a longtime observer of the university, she's one of the greatest champions of of, of the town gown partnership and uh, her breadth of lectures and courses and travel programs and school programs are a great reminder of, of what a university uh, brings to a community. So with that, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Grayson Westfalls, board certified family medicine physician at Tananaw Valley Clinic, currently seeing patients at First Care. Originally from a small town in rural Colorado, he attended college at Eastern New Mexico University and med school at the University of Colorado Health Services Center. Dr. Westfall did his residency training at Emmanuel St. Joseph's Mayo Health Systems, University of Minnesota, where he met his wife, Laura Bruner. Dr. Westfall moved back to Colorado, where he practiced in the rural town of Lyman, Colorado for two years, while Laura finished her pediatric residency training. Upon completion of her pediatric residency, both Dr. Bruner and Westfall moved to Fairbanks where they both practice as part of Foundation Health Partners System. Besides practicing as a board certified family physician at First Care, Dr. Westfall has been involved in hospital and clinic leadership for a number of years, most recently involved with business development and innovation for FHP. As someone who had the pleasure of working with Grayson for two years, I simply wish to say Grayson Westfall is exceptionally bright insightful, conscientious physician who brings an incredible sense of humor when working with others. And as a physician, he's extremely well regarded by patients, family members of his patients and professional colleagues alike. He and Laura have two children, nine-year-old son Jackson and his 12-year-old daughter Anna, an avid fisherman, lover of archeology span and a rabid fan of the Denver Broncos. Dr. Westfall said one of his favorite patient evaluations he's received was from a carpenter who wrote, Dr. Westfall is a good physician, just one bubble off plumb. And, and with that, let me welcome Dr. Grayson Westfall, who will be speaking about seeking health information in the age of the internet. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So um, when Mike asked me about nine months ago to come and talk to uh, the UAF uh, Healthy Lecture Living Series, he asked me to speak a little bit about technology. Um, and. Uh, I thought about, I mean, I, I, I immediately said yes because I love Mike Powers and uh, if Mike Powers asked me to do something, I'm just going to do it without even thinking about it. I'd lay down in traffic for Mike if he asked me to do it. But um, the topic that he asked me to talk to you guys about this evening was about technology and the use of Dr. Google in the, in the, in the, in the year 2021. Um, so th that's what I'd like to spend some time talking with you about th this evening. And what I'd really like to focus on is sort of the physician-patient um, relationship in 2021. Before I start, I have no commercial bias. Um, I have nothing to disclose. If uh, TED Talks wants to pay me uh, some money to uh, uh, then donate to UAF uh, uh, to, to do this again, I'd be happy to do that. But short of that, I have nothing to disclose. Um, so who am I? Um, I think that I can uh, uh, best uh, sum that up is I am a 45-year-old uh, uh, guy. I grew up in rural Colorado. I uh, grew up in a place where we didn't, we weren't really uh, adopters of technology. We didn't have a home personal computer until I think I was uh, probably about in college. Um, so I'd like to just first off say I am not a techie. I am not a person who has an Apple Watch who knows I'm not wearing a watch. I'm not a person who engages in every little bit of uh, you know um, new and um, useful technology that's available to us in the in, in the healthcare industry. <clears throat> um, my nine my my nine year old and my twelve year old actually have to still sync my Bluetooth on my on my phone fre frequently. So, um, uh, I just want to just just um, uh, be be uh, upfront about that. Um, as I was thinking about putting this talk together, uh, I also I was like, well, okay, well, what, what what should I talk about, uh, or how should I approach this? And so I, I watched some amazing talks on you know TED you know everybody's heard of TED talks, and so I looked at TED talks and I thought. Oh yeah, I'm not those. I'm not that technology guy. Um, and uh, uh, my, I see my father-in-law in the in the uh, 
the audience this evening. And uh, he is a brilliant and uh, very technologically savvy person. And when he heard about me giving a talk about technology, he goes, oh, OK, that's great. Good luck with that. <laughs> So what is Dr. Google? Um, I, you know, I, I, I searched far and wide, and probably the, the best uh, definition that I, can, you know, that I could find was I looked on urbandictionary.com. And essentially, Dr. Google is um, the person who, search, who uses some sort of search engine on the internet to make them a medically qualified physician. Um, and uh, this, this phenomenon has been going on for uh, just over 20 years now. And it's really changed. Um, I like the, 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 I don't know if you guys can see, see behind me, but I like uh, how they laid it out. So Mrs. Smith, my son has dengue fever and I searched it on Dr. Google and, or I searched it on Google and Dr. James says, really, that's what Google says? Send him to the emergency room immediately. And Dr. James says, note to self, Dr. Smith, Mrs. Smith's son is fine, Mrs. Smith, however, has a case of Dr. Google. So that's what Dr. Google is. Um, so what, am I, what are my objectives tonight? Um, the first thing I would like to say is I'd like to set the table for a discussion about the use of technology, the use of the internet, um, and how that's changed and um, what it means for the physician-patient relationship in the year 2021. I'd like to talk a little bit about how that physician-patient relationship has evolved over time. Um, uh, I would like to discuss a little bit about how technology can be useful. How can Dr. Google be useful? Because it really actually is. Um, I'd like to discuss do's and don'ts. Uh, and then um, also, you know, it's 82 degrees outside in the most beautiful community in the world, in my opinion. It's, it's amazing out there. So I'd like to have some fun. And uh, as, the, as the line goes, trust me, I'm a doctor. So, um, OK, so when you are a physician, you're doing your residency training, um, and you guys may not be able to see this, but um, we do a lot of case presentations, and that's how you learn. Um, and so I'd like to present, this is actually a real patient. I just saw this patient a couple weeks ago and, and asked them for a permission to, uh, to, re to, to provide this uh, information to you. And she's a delightful woman and said, of course, absolutely. So um, this was a patient I saw a number of years ago. She's a 45, she, at that time, she was a 45-year-old female. Uh, she presented to the office in a 15-minute appointment to discuss the, quote, fatigue. Fatigue is, uh, if, you, if you do some sort of Google checker or symptom checker on the internet, uh, fatigue probably has 211 di you know, possible diagnoses. So that's one of those ones that sort of makes a physician kind of get a pit in their stomach and go, OK, patience. Um, so this particular patient, though, was particularly anxious. It was quite amazing. She literally had brought in 19 pages of internet research um, to this appointment. And she wanted a provider to read it and then go over each page with her. Um, uh, and she told me <laughs> at the time, and we were laughing about a couple weeks ago, she said, I'm not sure which one, but I'm pretty sure I have one of these seven types of cancer. I'm like, OK, well, that, that sounds horrible. And she wanted to check for pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is an inflammation of the pancreas. Um, and uh, the reason, the rationale for that is she had been to Arizona the week before, and she'd seen a scorpion in the desert. And so she was pretty sure that some of her symptoms changed after she saw the scorpion. And scorpions um, in the island of Trinidad can cause pancreatitis um, if you get a certain amount of venom. And so she wanted that checked, actually. So she complained of fatigue and bloating and not feel right. She sometimes gets chest pain and abdominal pain. Um, she does feel short of breath and has headaches from time to time. She does have a past medical history of high blood pressure. Uh, she um, had a little bit of an elevated body weight, and she was still having her menstrual cycle. So these are all the things that, you know, um, as a physician, we start to think about when we go through uh, and, and listen to a patient's concerns. Um, her chest pain usually occurred at night. So usually chest pain occurs at night is, is, is usually non-cardiac related. Um, the person who uh, tells me that they're pushing something up a hill that's heavy and then develops chest pain, that makes me a lot more worried as a physician. Um, she reads in bed, and uh, that usually uh, 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 about what can cause her fatigue. Um, she's short of breath, and she wakes up gasping at night. She wakes up just literally so short of breath, she just she chokes and she gasps. It's like, oh, that sounds horrible. And she said she's gained some weight, she feels bloated, and she has daytime sleepiness. So basically, she can take a nap anywhere. So she came in with a typed up on a Microsoft Word document. It was amazing what exactly that she wanted. She'd done such a beautiful job of research on the internet. She said she wanted a blood count, and she wanted her blood sugars checked, and her kidney and liver checked. She wanted her pancreas enzymes because she was very worried about the, uh, the uh, scorpion sting. 
Uh, she wanted some heart enzymes and she wanted her thyroid checked. You see these kind of, uh, these word, these letters there, CA-199, CEA, CA-125. These are cancer markers. These are sort of genetic cancer markers that we use, um, not necessarily for screening purposes, uh, but when we have a suspicion of a diagnosis, when we're trying to figure out where to take a particular case. Um, they're very, very expensive tests. Um, she wanted her antibodies checked. Um, she wanted a whole body MRI. I don't know if anybody has ever had an MRI. An MRI is a quite uncomfortable experience. I've had MRIs. It makes you pretty, feel pretty claustrophobic. So a whole body MRI would take several hours. That sounds horrible. Um, not to mention pretty expensive. She wanted her iron checked. Um, and she wanted her ceruloplasm checked, which is a, a sort of a, a test for copper de deposition. Um, she was pretty sure she was in liver failure as well and that the abnormal copper de deposition disease was causing this. She wanted her stool collected for looking for parasites because she was pretty sure she had parasites. And the best one that I, and this is, I'll, I'll forever remember this, we were laughing about this a couple weeks ago. She'd emailed a professor uh, at, I think, Queenlands College in Australia uh, who created uh, an assay to look for the type of scorpion sting, uh, like an assay, the, the venom, um, and so she wanted to know which scorpion had stung her. So anyways, I thought that was interesting. Um, she asked me if I could email him at the time because uh, she hadn't heard back from him, surprisingly. So, so um, there's that moment um, as a physician when a patient gives you a bunch of information and there's that that moment where you're just like, wow, where do I take this? Um, most, mo most complaints are, are, are pretty you know, gen you know, regular and routine and I know exactly where to take it, but there's those moments where it's like, okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath, where do I take this one? And so uh, my attendings in, in uh, med school and residency taught me to uh, just take a deep breath and uh, a pregnant pause, so to speak. So that's what I did. And I searched in my brain, what could I possibly say to this poor woman who is complete, incredibly anxious about her health? And uh, I came up with, sounds like you have an medical, uh, amazing amount, you've done an amazing amount of medical research. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, do you snore? Do you have headaches? Um, and then do you wake up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? Do you urinate a lot? Um, the answers were yes to all three. Um, on her physical exam, um, so she was, she looked pretty good. She looked just like a normal person, like, like, like everybody here, here. Her vitals, her blood pressure was a little high at 145 over 92. Um, her height, you notice she's a little bit short and uh, her weight, she's a little bit of a ideal body weight at 247 pounds. Um, but her exam is otherwise normal. Uh, I don't find much. Um, I did look at her records and she hadn't had any of the typical preventative health stuff that, you know, people need. Um, she hadn't had a mammogram, for instance. Um, so when you're a physician, you're thinking about different, different uh, you know, uh, diagnoses. The first place we start is, okay, let's start with the basics. Let's start with where's your preventative health? Like, um, she obviously had some issues that we were, you know, think, you know that I was thinking about. Um, her weight being a big one. Um, um, I tried to work with her about paring down some of those lab tests that, and the whole body MRIs that probably would have cost somewhere between five and $10,000 uh, legitimately. Um, uh, I could talk her into kind of the basics, the blood count, check her glucose, check her thyroid, check her kidney and liver. Um, and then we did agree that she really, really wanted the, the pancreas assessed. And so I said, okay, that seems pretty reasonable. But rather than, um, go call the guy in Australia, let's, let's just start with the pancreas enzymes, and then if the pancreas enzymes are elevated, well then maybe we can go and reach out to that person. Um, and so we scheduled a follow-up appointment in a couple weeks. So her labs came back, uh, her blood count looked okay, she wasn't anemic, so anemia is a real common cause of fatigue. Um, there wasn't anything else abnormal about her cells that made me think about cancer or something like that. Um, her liver enzymes, her kidney function, everything looked pretty good. Um, there's, you see a, something called a hemoglobin A1C. A hemoglobin A1C is an average blood sugar over the past 90 days, essentially. And uh, that was a little bit elevated, um, and so um, means she's a new diabetic. And so certainly diabetes can cause fatigue. Um, um, her pancreas enzymes came back normal, so we ended up uh, not needing to, to, to contact the guy from Australia. Um, I will tell you, I actually did reach out to the guy just to, just to let him know. Uh, uh, that we're all that we're all good, and uh, he actually did send me an email back about two months ago, two months later, saying, "I'm sorry, I couldn't get back with you. We were, you know, I was in the field, and uh, but I'm glad things worked out." So, 
all, all is well. And everything else looked okay. So when I think about this, the things that come out, uh, you know, I obviously she's a diabetic, that can certainly cause fatigue. I also think about she's pretty short in her, she's a little bit above ideal body weight, uh, I would say, uh, being generous, and 247 pounds. So could she have something called sleep apnea? Uh, sleep apnea is a condition where um, your, your, your body settles in the back of your throat and you snore. And, over to, and when you get into deep sleep, you essentially cut off that airway. Um, and so uh, you go apneic, meaning you, you have pauses in your breathing and you are not able to get good sleep in the proper sleep. So we got her set up with our sleep specialist and sure enough, she had sleep apnea and we treated her diabetes and success, she did great. And interestingly enough, she lost uh, uh, about 100 pounds um, uh, through exercise and diet and, and uh, just you know, being concerned about her health and then also the use of the CPAP machine. Um, now, I will say, I, this, my wife helped me put these slides together, and you'll notice that she used her CPAP. And my wife put in italicies, I, could, I just noticed this this evening, you have to wear it, or not just have it in the home. And so I want you to know I do have sleep apnea, and my wife is telling me something clearly. So if she's watching, thanks, honey, I appreciate it. <laughs> As I said, I saw her a couple weeks ago, she's doing well years later. So <clears throat> that is an example of how technology can be dangerous. And this is a real world example. This really did happen, every, every, every last bit of it. Um, and so um, that, that, that technology has really changed the physician-patient relationship. Now we have, you know, when I see you know, one of 30 patients in a day, all 30 of those people can be experts. They can be medical experts with, with you know, I don't have my phone on me, with, with, the, with, the, with the touch of a phone. Um, which, is, which is both scary and, um, you know, cool to think about. Um, so um, <clears throat> you see the picture of Norman Rockwell, you know, uh, are the good days, the good old days of doctoring gone? I don't think so. Um, but I do think we need to be conscientious about what has changed in the dynamic of this. So uh, to, to do that, I need to, uh, I don't want to bore you, but I do want to kind of go back a little bit about what are sort of the four models for the physician-patient relationship. Um, and probably m m many of the people in this room probably are used to the paternalistic model, which is sort of the physician's job is to promote the patient's well-being and not really care so much about the patient's um, uh, values as it pertains to their whatever medical diagnosis or disease you know, state that they have. Um, so there may be times when paternalistic health is important. For instance, uh, you know, if my, you know, uh, you know, if, if my family member falls and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, hits, hits their head, for instance, um, you know, uh, and let's say they're lo they've lost consciousness or something like that, you're going to need a doctor to be paternalistic and say, this is what we need to do and this is what we need to do now, as opposed to deliberate about what we do. So there's informative models. So an informative model is sort of where a physician is just a technician. It's sort of like a mechanic. Um, and I give you, you know, information and, and uh, without, without um, uh, care about your particular idea, uh, about your values of the system, uh, you get to choose. So you get to choose the laundry list of, you know, um, I'd like, a, you know, a side of a thyroid and a, some, some fries with that and, uh, you know, maybe a hemoglobin A1C and a, and a, cart, and a, and a whole body MRI. Um, you know, there's the interpretive model, which is more for sort of psychotherapists, counselors, that kind of thing, um, where sometimes patients' values about things are they're just not quite sure where, they're, where, they're, where things are at. And so a physician or a provider's job is really to, to help them figure out where, you know, help them define their values. And then the last one, which is the deliberative model, which is more what, we, what was taught in med school, what is more taught in residencies these days, which, is, um, which kind of focuses on a shared decision-making model, which is... Um, the patient's values are sort of open to development. Um, uh, you know, the physician's obligation is to, arti is to be the expert, is to, to articulate and persuade the patient, inform them, be that technical expert, but also help the patient uh, figure out what their, what their values are. Um, so, and, and again, uh, this is probably where most physicians in terms of their training are now, or providers. And I say physicians, I mean uh, advanced, act, advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners and physician's assistants as well. So as I said, all four models have their justification. If you have a heart attack um, here, here tonight, I'm going to probably not ask you how you feel about your heart attack. I'm going to probably start chest compressions. Um, so um, I'm going to use that paternalistic model. 
um, you know, if you come into my office and have questions about, I'm just not sure what to do here, I'm going to probably use a more of a shared decision making model, more in that deliberative model. Um, again, physicians should be technical experts. Ideally, we should be good communicators. We should be listeners. We should be partners with our patients. We should be able to articulate their values, at least try to empathize and understand what their values are. Um, but we should also try to keep patients in between the navigational beacons, so to speak. And so um, if a patient comes in with a hangnail and says I, they want to be do not resuscitate because of their hangnail, um, I think I, I, that's my, my job is to say, OK, wait, it's a hangnail. Uh, it's not life threatening. So. Um, so in terms of, uh, I thought these pictures were kind of interesting. The one on the right, obviously, is a stock photo. And those are the happy, you know, happy patient, happy physician. The one on the left, actually, is a real one. And it's like, oh, gosh, that's that paternalistic model. That looks kind of scary. I'm not sure I'd want to see that physician, actually. <laughs> Yikes. So um, in preparation for this talk, I actually talked with a number of my colleagues um, about this. And uh, one of my colleagues actually went so far as to send me a, 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 that picture of Please do not, a picture of, of a coffee cup, very similar coffee cup, saying, please don't confuse your, uh, your Google search with my medical degree. And I was kind of surprised by that. I really thought in this day and age, we've had internet for, you know, really, we've been using it in, in the realm of healthcare for 20, 20 years. So I was really surprised that there were still a lot of people who were paternalistic about that. Um, so, um, but I also had a number of colleagues who were like, no, I love it. Um, and uh, the reason being is because I can focus my, if I understand what, what a patient is worried about, I can then focus my visit. It actually helps me be a little bit more efficient. So the physician attitudes, at least at Tannel Valley Clinic, uh, were kind of all over the board about that. So um, when we think about, um, you know, giving a talk like this, I want you guys to come out with some information. Um, as a physician, I spend my day looking up studies. I spend my day looking up um, synopses of a uh, particular medical condition that I may not be as familiar with or need to refresh my memory with. And so I am, I'm going to go a little bit nerd on you here and talk about it, just a couple studies here. Um, this first study, and if you guys are interested, there is a link at the bottom. Um, uh, from uh, the British Journal of General Practice. But this was a study, of, basically the way I can encapsulate this is this is a study of several thousand patients. Um, what it came out was, what came out was two thirds of all patients before they go to the doctor's office, search the internet in one way, shape or form. Which is quite, a, quite, quite amazing if you think about it. One of the standard questions that I ask with my patients, um, um, is have you read, you know, have you, is there anything on the internet or is there anything that you've maybe researched on your own that you're worried about? And probably only two or three of them tell the truth about that. But I always have suspected that it's actually far more. And again, we actually have some research that shows that. Um, so, or if they do, then they're, then they, they have this, this, they go a little bit white and then they get a little bit red and they're like, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't do that. And the answer is, you should be doing that. And I'm going to explain that here in a second. Um, so this particular study is really cool, because there's a couple thousand patients. It was statistically powered well. Um, so what was the effect on patient behavior of searching Dr. Google? And they, um, then um, the second question they were trying to answer is, how does the physician handle the information? Are they, are they schmucks about it? Um, are they paternalistic? Or do they try to engage in that shared decision-making model? And so, um, and, and what were the outcomes? So um, of those, you know, two thirds of all these people, people search the internet, two thirds of the respondents were not reassured by the, by the search, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it, it told me, well, Google isn't, isn't all that it's cracked up, cracked up to be. Um, however, one of the outcomes is that um, when they saw the doctor later, so, you know, pa you know patient A comes in to see, see me after doing some research and then, uh, we talk about that particular problem, and later they actually rated the physician higher uh, in terms of they felt that they were more competent um, if they had researched um, on the internet first. So it's actually, from a physician perspective, it actually helps me um, because it gives people confidence in my abilities. Um, interestingly enough, I was surprised by that. Um, now you'll see that I put um, 
quote unquote, more wise, were more likely to go to the doctor after a, after a search uh, of the internet. Um, what I mean by that is they actually put in the elderly uh, when they wrote this. They're saying that the elderly were more likely to go to the doctor after search, but I thought that was a bit pejorative. So I'm gonna say those um, who, uh, who uh, have more wisdom were more likely to go to the doctor after an internet search. Um, and then the more wisdom challenged, uh, so, so young, young people, uh, the more likely they were worried about uh, their particular problem. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So, so uh, um, you know, I'm going to use my mother-in-law as an example. She's here in the audience this evening. So, um, so uh, when she does her research, which I can promise you she does, because um, <laughs> she's a brilliant woman, um, she is much more reassured when she goes to the doctor's office and say, you know, uh, my nine, my 12 year old daughter. So, <clears throat> um, the other thing that, that we did find um, in this particular study is, um, the more people frequently search the internet for a medical condition, the more they are reassured overall. Um, so this is a continuation of this. So I guess, um, if I were to encapsulate this, the take home point is, Actually, people, um, one of the things that they found is people still schedule the appointment, right? Um, so it doesn't affect my, it doesn't affect business. It doesn't affect um, people um, not going to the doctor, or, you know, um, ended up sitting on plain complaints that should be seen by a doctor. Um, also, they didn't, one of the things that they found was patients didn't actually pick up new symptoms just by researching. One of the doctor's fears, and actually this was one of my, this is one of my colleagues. He was like, you know, all the time, you know, um, um, you know, people will look up something and then, you know, they'll, they'll say that they have like leg pain. And the next thing they know, they, they're pretty sure that they have chest pain. And what this research shows is it's not actually true. Um, and it's a pretty good study. Um, certainly the search didn't lead to distrust of physicians, which is a great thing. Um, we need to have trust in our, in our providers. Um, and actually the majority of the physicians, at least in, in Great Britain, um, uh, had described positive effects of, the, of their online search behavior. So it was kind of a win-win in most cases. Um, overall, um, the use of the internet is not seen by, as a threat for, by physicians there. And um, it did lead to um, a better way to communicate, a better um, sort of mutual understanding of a patient's medical conditions. So here's another study. I told you I'm a little bit of a nerd. So um, this one is kind of interesting. This one actually did show that Googling can raise anxiety levels. So um, that's actually a, a picture of my partner, uh, Dr. Zach Worley at First Care. So this one is amazing because I don't know if you guys know how medical research is done, but there's something called an institutional review board that has to go over every um, you know, uh, proposed study to make sure that you know, people aren't gonna get hurt, to make sure that things are not un unethical. So I'm surprised it got by the institutional review board, but basically this study had people hyperventilate in a bag for two minutes, which I don't know, that, that, the concept of that is just amazing to me. Um, and they had uh, one group of patients go and just sit down and have a glass of water and just chill and then wait five minutes and then Google search. And then they had the other group of patients who were hyperventilating go over and immediately start Google searching. And then they did a symptom uh, uh, sort of scoring and anxiety level checker, uh, essentially. And what they found was that, um, interestingly enough, surprisingly enough, not really, um, that if you um, hyperventilate in a bag for two minutes, you're gonna be a lot more worried about your health than if you wait five minutes. And so I guess my take home for that, um, and, and this, is a good, this is a good take home for that, if you develop weird symptoms, let's, and again, we know that you're researching on, on, on the internet, so by all means do it. But if you do it, if you have a symptom, wait five minutes. You know, uh, don't, don't just immediately go to your phone and say, oh, what is, what is this? Because that can lead to some unintended consequences of showing up at the doctor's office and paying more money at the copay and, and having a bunch of tests done that may, may not be, need to be done. Okay, one last one. Um, this particular one was just done a few months ago and I thought this was a very, um, it, so the first one was done in 2017, the next one was done in 2019, and then this one's 2021. Interesting, over time, as we become more sophisticated, these studies are, um, you know, uh, I suspect it's just because people are more savvy with the internet, um, but they're, they're, they're more pro-internet and poor, more pro-research as it pertains to, to healthcare diagnoses. So what they found is that um, patients could actually improve their own diagnostic accuracy negligibly by four to five percent. So uh, that's interesting. 
Um, there was no difference in uh, their anxiety levels, whether they Googled or not. Um, there was no difference in their ability to triage. And so, you know, for instance, that patient who has has uh, chest pain and they and they and they look on their phone. Okay, what do I need to be worried about? The the patients really couldn't tell which one. It didn't didn't really have any uh, prognostic capability of saying, yeah, the, I don't need to be seen by the doctor. Uh, this is not really chest pain, or I need to go see the doctor. Um, 75% of them were able to identify the severity of the situation and when to seek care. So they could say, okay, wait, chest pain, uh, that's actually not, not a good thing most, in many cases, and so I probably should see the doctor in that case. They didn't just stay home because of it, and they weren't reassured necessarily by it. Um, and as um, we find in most cases, um, women and adults over age 40 were much better at, uh, um, at researching the internet. Um, uh, and then people actually who had poorer health. So people who had a number of, I think, six or more medical conditions were actually in tune with their health enough that they knew um, they were better at uh, diagnostic accuracy on their own. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So what does this mean? On average, Dr. Google doesn't cause panic. It may not help you, but it, it's probably not going to hurt you. It's not going to give you an anxiety disorder most of the time. <clears throat> um, Patients that Google are generally more involved with their care. They're more informed. Um, I would say that in my experience, research makes them, um, and, and actually from these studies as well, or these studies confirm it, research actually activates them to get more engaged in their health care. And that's really what physicians are trying to do. I mean, we can't, <clears throat> we can't make you do you know, when you come to the doctor, I can't make you do anything. Um, but what I can do, hopefully, is motivate you, engage you in a certain level to um, be the consumer of your health care and take an active, um, uh, be more active and engaged in your health. Um, the other thing is you're going to need doctors for diagnosis um, and treatment. Um, but as far as physicians go, um, uh, I guess I would say, get over it, buddy, uh, is what I said to my partner. Um, Google's, Google's here to stay. I don't, I don't see that that's going to go away anytime soon, uh, judging by their, uh, their last assessed value. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> um, I think that we can, uh, uh, if you can't beat them, join them, is what I would say. So back to the doctor's office. So for those people who are at home, for those people who are here, um, <clears throat> Physicians are there to help you. We really are. Um, you don't have to be embarrassed about what you read. As I said, probably only two or three people cop to the answer of, yes, I've been researching Google. So just tell us. You know, the thing that I'm not very good at, I'm, I'm not a good soothsayer. I am not, a, um, I don't know, remember the old Johnny Carson Karnak says, I don't read minds. Um, I, uh, you know, I missed the crystal ball day of medical school. Uh, in fact, most of us did, and so I didn't get one. And so I guess what I'm saying by that is um, tell us what you're worried about. That's all we really want to know is what are you worried about? And if it takes Google, and it's 19 pages of papers, hopefully not 19 pages, but if it takes um, some focused um, uh, research um, and to bring that into the doctor, that's what we're there for. That's, that's, that's why you come and see us. Um, I will say, uh, and then this kind of goes to the do's and don'ts, the physician patient relationship is not like a drive through window. You know, it's not like a, <clears throat> I think I've said this once, but it's not like I'd like a side of a thyroid test and a blood count and a Big Mac and how about that whole body MRI? It doesn't work that way. There's a, there's a number of reasons why it doesn't work, but one of the things is, one of the fundamental tenets of being a physician is don't do any harm. And so some of those tests can actually be harmful um, and then two, of course, everybody recognizes that insurance does play a big part in what, what, what does and doesn't get done in healthcare. <clears throat> Allow your doctor to be the technical expert. So if you bring stuff in, you know, going back to my, uh, going back to my, my patient uh, in, in the you know, uh, presentation in the beginning, if you come in and say, I'm worried, it's okay to come in and say, I'm worried that I have been stung by a scorpion, that's great. That's okay. That's my job to listen to that. If I say, you know what, the good news is um, the uh, <clears throat> scorpion sting of Trinidad is the only one that causes pancreatitis, um, I think you're probably okay, and I don't see any evidence that you were stung, and it was like two weeks ago, um, then believe that your doctor is the expert and, and, and understand that. And, 
and take, you know, and trust your physician because that we, it, we have to have that, that trust in that relationship. Allow your doctor to be the technical expert um, and allow them to keep you between the navigational beacons, so to speak. But then at the same time, um, you know, uh, share the values about, you know, share your own values about um, what you're worried about, about your healthcare condition. Um, and then again, just engage in that shared decision making. Gonna change gears just a little bit here. I know we're about 35 minutes into this. So I <clears throat> just wanna talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. Um, and apparently I can't spell, um, so I do apologize there. So everybody's heard of Watson. Um, anybody here heard of Watson? So um, I, I, I know my father-in-law has. So anyways, um, Watson is this uh, concept of this, this IBM supercomputer that looks, that basically can beat people in chess and can win against the best players in Jeopardy. You see the Jeopardy picture. Um, and so right now, what's gonna hap what's happening, what they're looking at is, what is the utility of Watson in the healthcare world? Um, and I saw an article, and I was just like, oh, that's a bunch of hogwash, um, the other day <clears throat> about, well, it's gonna take over the doctor's office. We're just gonna have, we're gonna have uh, computers drive healthcare, and we're not gonna really need what we think we're gonna need in terms of healthcare providers. And I don't, I don't think that's true. I think where that is gonna be helpful, where Watson's gonna be helpful is for those really esoteric diagnoses of, of um, different types of cancers or rare diagnoses, rare genetic disorders where, where uh, we don't quite know what to do with it. Um, uh, so it'll help us in you know, um, you know, therapeutics, it'll help us figure out diagnoses um, at tertiary care centers probably not at Tannehill Valley Clinic First Care. Where you might see a version of Watson is we still don't have an electronic medical record that's actually functional like we want it to be as a physician. I know this is shocking for everybody. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that um, I would see sort of a version of Watson occurring is that Watson will be important for preventative health. We will have computers at some point who will just call you and say, um, sir or ma'am, you are overdue for your colonoscopy, let us get that scheduled for you. And we're gonna take that out of the doctor's hands, out of the nurse's hands, and that's, I would guess that's gonna come in the next 10 years. Um, but we're not there yet, so. Um, you see a picture here of, uh, I can't remember the doctor, but on uh, Star Trek, and that's a holographic uh, doctor. I don't think that that's probably coming anytime soon. Um, so uh, I don't think we have to worry about that. So, one question, or one thing that I give, that I give a lot of patients um, is I try to give patient plans, and um, I'm not always successful uh, on busy days, but I try to give a synopsis of kind of what happened during their plan of care and kind of here's my medical advice, et cetera. <clears throat> but one of the things that I do at the end of the visit is I say, you know what, what I'd like you to do is I don't, I, you know, I don't have all the information here. I'd like you to go to the, to the internet and research this on your own, and I do, I tell, 20 people that a day, probably. Um, but I also caution them, go to the right internet websites. Um, I probably, I, I guess my question is, uh, Facebook, um, they did so well, uh, you know, with the election um, the, past, uh, the past few years. Um, you know, it's always a temptation, but I'd probably stay away from them. Uh, you know, fake medical news, you know, take it or leave it. Um, but mayoclinic.org um, has an incredible website. WebMD actually is really good, healthychildren.org, um, and then there's some others. The CDC and the NIH websites are great for patients, and they present non-biased, accurate information um, that, I, that I personally find valuable and reassuring for patients. So anyways. So other uses of technology, I don't know if you guys can see that old computer in the background. Um, I, I like that picture. Uh, I miss those floppy disks. Um, so, I think that one of the things that is in the way of technology in the use in healthcare is the law <laughs> and is the lack of internet. So everybody lives in Fairbanks. Um, who has great broadband internet here? Um, probably half of, half of the people if we were being honest here. And so um, that would be the first thing is until we all are uh, on the same sheet of music from a, uh, you know, from a broadband internet perspective, we're not ever gonna get to where we need to go. There's also a number of state laws that, you know, fortunately, one of the good things about COVID is some of those laws went away, um, those silly laws about telemedicine, et cetera, but they still could creep back. 
Um, so until all the state laws and federal laws around the use of, of, of uh, healthcare technology are, are created in a way that um, are patient-centered but also don't disrupt the ability to, um, to uh, make things better, um, that, that, that is definitely a governor on the ability to, to, to the governor on, on, on technology medically. Um, I would say wearables with a purpose. Um, who has a smartwatch um, who uses it for, uh, for health reasons? Um, you know, I don't know if you guys remember six years ago, five, six years ago, there, the, this, the Apple Watch came out and everybody's like, it's going to forever change how we use, um, you know, our relationship with doctors and doctors are going to have our iPhones and, and we're just going to use an, our, the ultrasound on their iPhone and we're going to do all that, you know, you know. And um, what I would say is um, it was a uh, solution um, to something that was, uh, that, that there really wasn't a problem yet. Um, and so I will tell you just personally, I, the, the iPhone technology that's been helpful is a cardiac rhythm strip. I have uh, detected two wildly abnormal heart rhythms um, because, of a, because of an iPhone. So that, and that was actually really cool. Uh, super, super rare uh, conditions in both of them. And the cardiologist called me and was like, wow, that is amazing. And I was like, I know, right? Um, <clears throat> and so there will be wearables with a purpose, but most of them aren't here. I will tell you that. Um, we do have continuous glucose monitoring. That's becoming the standard of care. Um, there will be telemedicine. Probably some of you have used First Care uh, for telemedicine or other, you know, teledoc. And right now, we don't have, um, you know, we're not checking uh, vitals a lot of times. Um, um, at some point, part of your package with your insurance and whatever medical provider you have will include just an electronic downloadable blood pressure monitor, you know, heart rate. Um, pulse ox, all that stuff. That's probably coming in three years, I would imagine, maybe five. But that will be part of just the standard of you, you signing up for a particular health insurance and you're going to work with a particular clinic. Um, and then there's a number of other things. I put medical tricorders from start for any Trekkie out there. I am a little bit of a Trekkie. Uh, I told you I was a nerd earlier. So um, probably uh, uh, um, medical tricorders are a ways away. I watched a TED talk talking about that and yeah, they, they don't know what they're talking about. So. So I guess in closing, um, this is a picture of my daughter graduating from kindergarten, by the way, and uh, my daughter, Anna. <clears throat> and um, technology is here to stay. These, you know, people are continuing to improve upon the technology. Um, you know, people are demanding use of technology. Um, the world is rapidly changing and will continue to do so. Um, and so my daughter's gonna keep updating my iPhone. She does all the time. Uh, even if I don't want her to. But what's really at the heart of healthcare is a physician patient relationship. And I think at our core, I think everybody knows that. Um, healthcare is about feelings, it's about communication, it's about listening. And while we all have tools, we have stethoscopes and we have ultrasounds and we have Google, Dr. Google, um, what it comes down to is transparent communication and uh, shared decision making with a provider or a physician. So, and remember, an Apple day keeps Google away. So, with that, thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk to you guys today. It was wonderful. And uh, uh, thank you very much. I would be more than happy to, uh, to accept uh, any thoughtful and uh, provoking uh, questions. Thank you, and, and thanks for that uh, great talk, Dr. Westall. Really interesting. So when you were talking about uh, smart watches, that, that, that got me thinking, because I'm always checking, you know, how did I sleep last night, and what's my heart rate, and things like that. And so, and I just want to be clear, are you saying, yeah, the technology isn't quite there yet for me to trust that so much? Great question, exactly. Um, so um, these particular patients, I was able to, we were able to kind of pick up something that was pretty abnormal from a rhythm. Um, but then there was, then and that just kind of, uh, I almost look at it as kind of a screening. It screened it, right? And now we've identified that there's potentially a problem and so now we have to um, di dive into it, to delve into it. So now we need to do a 48 hour, you know, you know, halter, what we call halter monitor. And so, um, you know, the, the, the wearables um, craze is like, it's gonna reduce the cost of healthcare. And I think we'll get there someday, I really do. But um, uh, first of all, the whole healthcare structure has to change, right? Um, 
And then two, um, we have to know and be able to work, work with those companies to trust that data because it, I think that's what it is, but I'm not for sure. I, I'm going to need this full halter monitor and a cardiology consult and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and so um, it certainly identified two things that, and actually both of them were accurate. Um, I will say there's one other one that I, that was inaccurate. I did, I, there was a third one that, that I was like, actually, you know, I was like, I think this might be something and it turned out it was nothing. It was just a kind of a computer blip on the, on the phone. So it's not there yet, um, um, but it will get there. Um, I just don't have a, a crystal ball to know, but I think, I, but I do think that that particular one with cardiac rhythm strips, as I've seen, because it's already, already been helpful, I, I foresee us using that one more and more. Hi, that was a great talk. Thanks for um, enlightening us about some of those issues. Um, how, do you think doctors use Dr. Google? <laughs> Well, now you're now you're just making me give away trade secrets. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we use uh, so uh, perfect example. I had a patient the other day um, who had come in and was pretty convinced that they had a particular diagnosis that I had never ever heard of. I had never heard of it. hadn't studied it in medical school. Uh, it was just so rare and esoteric that I was like. Yeah, I don't know. So I swung the computer over as I, I said, tell me more. Tell me your symptoms. And as, as, they were t as this nice uh, woman was telling me her symptoms, I was typing furiously into Google to figure <laughs> out, uh, just putting in a symptom checker. And it, what it did was it, um, I used it because it gave me a list of 10 diagnoses that I need to think about. And um, she, you know, I, so I, you know, and I was like, oh, got it. Okay. What they, what they really mean is this. Um, and so it gave, you know, so it, pr it provided me you know, my physician brain provides the context, and that's really probably what physicians do is we provide the context, you know, when it comes to using Dr. Google, we're really good at providing context, right? Hopefully, hopefully that's what we're good at. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we do that all the time. So, so, I actually had one patient call me on it a number of years ago, and I swung the computer over, I was like, yes I am, and here's what we're finding. <laughs> Are there sites other than Google that only doctors have access to to do research? There are, yeah. Um, so, I am fortunate enough to work for a very awesome organization, Foundation Health Partners, that um, gives us an incredible amount of resources compared to other places that I've been. Um, so the things that I, that I, that I, that, I, that they fortunately pay for is something called up to date and up to date is an incredibly expensive medical search engine that is geared for physicians, um, and, um, is comprehensive. And so if I'm looking up, you know, if, um, I had a young woman the other day who, um, had a diagnosis of COPD in a non-smoker and she was 40 and I'm like, Ooh, something's wrong here. There's something genetically going on here. And so. You know, so I was like, okay, alpha one antitrypsin. How do I order that? Um, and so, and are, are there other things I need to, to to consider ordering? And so I was able to look on up to date and say, okay, it's this, this, and this. Oh, yep, yep, I remember that. Yep, okay, done. And uh, and then you know, uh, get get that patient what they needed. And so, yes, absolutely, there are, there are medical things that you know, medical sites that we use that are pay services um, that are more you know um, more geared for you know physicians. Thank you. I guess this is just more of a comment. Uh, but when you were talking about uh, Dr. Googling, one of the things I found to be really helpful is, is uh, doing internet searches after I've visited the doctor and received a diagnosis. And then it gives me you know, somewhere to look. And I realize other people have this. And, and it's super helpful. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with you. And if, uh, that first site, or that, that first I think I presented three three studies there, and that first study was actually said that exact that exact thing is that um, it gave people um, Google searching gave their their gave them more um, uh, confidence in their physicians um, before and after um, the visit, and so absolutely. Um, and then, as I said, just uh, you know, probably 20 times a day, I tell people, hey, you know what, you have X diagnosis, so you have diverticulitis. Um, go to WebMD. They have a great synopsis for patients about what diverticulitis is and what to you know what to do about it. Um, even though I've gone over this, there's actually pretty good research that, that when a when a physician gives a patient um, information, 
patients only remember 10 to 20% of that information, right? And that makes sense because, um, you know, again, that, that, that can be for any number of reasons, but a lot of times I talk in medical jargon even when I don't realize I'm talking in medical jargon. Um, and so, you know, patients want to be, you know, they want to be polite, so they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and so um, I try really hard. I mean, I think all physicians do, but we, we certainly make that mistake. And so, um, and then two, just the, you know, sometimes it's a shock of a diagnosis. Um, so, um, you, you know, I just give this person a diagnosis, of a really bad diagnosis. They might remember 2% of what I told them. Um, you know, and so absolutely. Yeah, so Dr. Westfall, if, if you, you, we know that insurance companies can deny testing and things that they're, they feel they're not medically necessary. <clears throat> Have you found yet any relationship with, say, if you can validate it with your Google search, they may be more inclined to support that testing? Have we seen any kind of relationship yet? Um, not that I'm aware of. It's an interesting question. Um, I think that um, a savvy provider is very good at crafting a note to um, make it sound like the worst case scenario <laughs> um, while not, you know, while also still uh, hedging their bets. And that's really what gets a study paid for, quite frankly, in my, in my, in my business. So, um, and, and that's a, you know, family, it's walk-in family medicine. And so that's a little bit different. You know, if you're an ER, you, you just order tests, whatever tests you want, and they're required to pay, but essentially, but, but, you know, certainly in an outpatient setting. Um, so, but no, I have not seen that. That's an interesting question. I'll have to think about that one, but not, not yeah, to my ideal. Yeah, totally. And it would be interesting, and it suggests that you test for this, this, and this. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. We may see that. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Other questions? Well, seeing none, once again, Dr. Grayson Westfall, thank, thank you, you for your time. time.